now the latest from ITV News Meridian with Fred Dynage and Sangeeta Barbara. Good evening, welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines in the south. How a bird's nest caused carbon monoxide fumes to leak into this man's house. Have you got an alarm in your home? How much is your driveway worth? The homeowners cashing in as railway stations lose hundreds of parking spaces. Justice for Chunky, the little dog abused by teenagers who's gone to Westminster to try to change the law. And double, double trouble. A special day for the family with not one, but two sets of identical twins. Good evening to you. Welcome. Get a carbon monoxide alarm. The warning tonight from a man who found out he was inhaling the deadly gas at home. Peter Irish was alerted to the problem during a visit to a stop smoking clinic. His carbon monoxide levels were so high, nurses didn't believe he had kicked the habit. When he insisted he had, he realised he must find out exactly where the killer gas was leaking from as soon as possible. Richard Slee takes up the story. Peter Irish considers himself very lucky to be alive. It was during a checkup soon after he stopped smoking that his carbon monoxide levels were measured as much higher than when he was on the fags. The doctor thought an appliance at home might be responsible, so Peter fitted a carbon monoxide alarm in his living room. That evening, there was an instant result. Turn the fire on and within half an hour, an hour, the alarm had gone off. So it meant that there was carbon monoxide in here, so I quickly turned that off, called an engineer out the next day to come and have a look at the fire, and he said, it's a wonder you're not dead. Peter's chimney was completely blocked by a huge bird's nest. It was removed by a chimney sweep, but he's kept some of it to remind him of his close call. Absolutely complete shock, and I'm telling everybody I can think of um, the message, and uh, you'll be surprised the amount of people that said, well... I'm going to go and get some because I haven't got any. We all think of smoke detectors, but we don't think of carbon monoxide. According to staff at this showroom, gas fires are starting to make a comeback after years of wood burners being so fashionable. And that means it's even more important to employ a chimney sweep. The first thing we do before we install any fire, whether it's gas or solid fuel, is to make sure that the chimney is checked and tested. The most important thing after that is an annual service. This again ensures the ongoing safety of your fire. How long does it take for a bird to build a nest? Certainly less than a year. Had Peter got his gas fire serviced more often or even fitted a carbon monoxide alarm sooner, he would have spotted the problem before he and his family's lives were put in danger. What would your advice be to anybody that hasn't got one of these alarms? Go down the B&Q or wherever tonight, buy one, put the battery in and stick it up on the ceiling. You never know what's around the corner. Peter now has a new gas fire which is about to be installed and he's booked a regular annual service. Richard Slee, ITV News, Bedhampton. Lucky escape indeed in that story and the rest of the day's news here in the South on our website. Just go to itv.com forward slash Meridian. A man has gone on trial accused of an acid attack on a woman in Southampton. Mother of six, Carla Whitlock, was blinded in one eye in the attack outside the Turtle Bay restaurant last September. Billy Midmore, who's 23 and from London, has pleaded not guilty to causing grievous bodily harm. His brother Geoffrey Midmore has pleaded guilty to the same charge. Three men who smashed a car into a bank in Hedge End today are being hunted by police. They drove a Vauxhall Astra into HSBC in Northern Road at 10.30 this morning. The men were inside the building for some time before leaving in a white Audi. Any witnesses are asked to come forward. Police in Crawley have arrested 19 people as part of a police crackdown on drugs in the town. So far, Class A and B drugs with a street value of £20,000 have been seized, as well as £90,000 worth of cash. Arrests have been made for drug possession and money laundering. 
CCTV has been released of a man detectives want to trace in connection with a reported assault and robbery in Brighton. A 34-year-old man was knocked to the floor in Queen's Road near Budgeons on Sunday the 28th of February. Thousands of rail passengers who drive to stations in the south are facing months of disruption as station car parks are redeveloped to meet a massive rise in commuters. Yes, many will close for several months at stations in Hampshire, Surrey and Berkshire, but help is at hand. ITV News Meridian can reveal many local people are renting out their driveways to ease the misery. Our transport correspondent Mike Pearce has more. For those who drive to stations, finding a space to park is becoming a nightmare. Car parks are as packed as the trains. So now action is being taken, with an extra 1,400 spaces at the busiest southwest train stations. It's part of a £50 million improvement plan. Well, this is the station car park at Wokingham, where they're creating an extra 200 spaces. But here's the problem. It will be closed for the next four months while they carry out the work. I had to catch a train from somewhere else and then, you know, I had to start my journey 30 minutes earlier than what I used to do. It's kind of inconvenient, yeah. It is awful. Why? Because, because I, I, it's not, I don't have enough places and no parking area somewhere else, yeah, but it will be good, I understand it, yeah, so I hope it will be better. What we want to see now is plenty of information made available, lots of signs up saying where they can find alternative parking, um, you know, season ticket holders may be contacted in advance to warn them. But help is at hand. Local people are being asked to rent out their drives to help while the car parks are extended. The cost here at Brookwood in Surrey is £5 a day. Locals have put their drives on websites and even posted notes in local shops. I think so, yeah, why not? S sitting empty. You might as well help other people, but also make a little bit of an income from it. Why not? And do you think it is going to be an issue here? I think it is, yeah, because that car park is full to capacity every day. At stations like Farnborough and Fleet, the car parks have already been extended with an upper deck. The same is on the way for many more. I suppose a lot of commuters will say, is there any other way of doing this? Do you really have to close all the car parks? Unfortunately not. Um, it is uh, um, unavoidable in some locations where we unfortunately will have to close the car parks to do the works. Where we can, we stagger the work so that we do still provide car parking spaces, especially for our season ticket holders. Is it going to really mean the spaces are available when we turn up and they currently can't get one? Um, well, we'll try our best. Um, we, we put out a lot of information inf through our website, through social media. We will do leaflet drops and, and we also do sessions at the locations involved. Mike Pierce, ITV News, Farnborough Station. In other news, Hampshire County Council has this afternoon voted to stop funding specialist breastfeeding experts in the county. Mother Lindsay Lawman has been campaigning to keep the service, which she says is invaluable to mums who struggle to feed their babies. She gave an impassioned speech before today's meeting and told us why it's so important to keep specialist counsellors in addition to breastfeeding clinics. We have breastfeeding counsellors who have two and a half years of breastfeeding counselling training and if this new model goes ahead then we're going to see health visitors taking over that service. Now health visitors do a brilliant job, um, they have a, a universal remit um, and breastfeeding is of course part of that but it is just part of that. Uh, it's not a specialism of theirs and so I'm really concerned that we're going to see a drop in breastfeeding rates. Meanwhile, more than 1,100 people have given their views on Hampshire County Council's plans to close dozens of children's centres to save money. A 10-week public consultation opened last month on proposals, which include reducing 56 children's centres to just 11 hubs. A final decision will be made in July. Well, you're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. We are delighted you are. Thank you, as always, for choosing us. Coming up... How marine experts in Brighton are helping the Maldives to mend its coral. And I'll have all the weather details. The April showers are making an earlier appearance this year, but fear not, there's still plenty of spring sunshine still to come. As good as the Maldives, maybe. <laughs> well, for more on all of our stories, do head to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Any views or news, call us, please. 0808 10 10 095 is the number to ring. Or get in touch via Facebook, or should you prefer, why not send us a tweet at ITV Meridian.
There's a warning to parents this evening over a huge increase in the number of children being diagnosed with scarlet fever. 600 cases a week are being diagnosed across the country. The NHS has now issued a major alert about the scale of the infection. Well, it mainly affects children between the ages of two and eight. Michael Billington has been speaking to a GP whose own daughter fell ill. Rectangle. Yeah. Semicircle. Yeah, Even when Dr Zoe Norris's five-year-old daughter Emma fell ill, she almost didn't consider that it could be scarlet fever. It almost looked like a, an allergic rash to start with. It was that kind of redness that came up quite quickly um, but then very quickly spread and by the time we got to three or four days in it was all over her and then it was quite clear that this was more than just a bit of a heat rash. Having seen just one case in her entire career Dr Norris was more familiar with textbook pictures of the symptoms than seeing the real thing. It wasn't top of my list of things that would be causing a rash in my own children um, but then realising actually I have been seeing more of it in my own practice. Um, it shouldn't really be a surprise. Emma's the typical age at which children get this. She was just turned five um, and then there were a few other cases at school as well so it had clearly been going round. In fact, last year saw cases more than double, and this year the number of children infected with scarlet fever has reached its highest since the 1960s. 6,157 children across the country have been diagnosed since September. That's compared to just under 1,500 in 2010-2011. The infection rate quadrupling in just five years. Parents are now being told to look out for a fine red rash which feels like sandpaper, swollen glands in the neck and a sore throat, and a swollen red and white tongue. Doctors insist the infection isn't serious if it's caught quickly, but without treatment could lead to complications. The problem in the past has always been, when we didn't have access to antibiotics, that there's a small group of children who'll go on to develop an immune response where their body will try and attack the infection around the heart and the kidneys and that's when you get rheumatic fever and you can get kidney damage and that's what we typically think of when we think of scarlet fever. And all the animals are very worried. Emma recovered in just a few days with the course of antibiotics and doctors stress it can be easily treated but the NHS has issued a major alert for parents because of the sheer scale of the infection. Michael Billington, ITV News. More news in Highclere Castle, used of course in the filming of Downton Abbey, remains only partially open after it was damaged at the weekend by Storm Katie. The stately home on the Hampshire-Berkshire border lost power and trees and branches came down blocking roads. There was also some flooding which closed the car parks. Highclere's manager told us that shutting the popular attraction for two days was not an easy decision to take. We, we are truly appreciative of the public interest in Highclere and, and endeavour to do what we can um, to welcome our visitors. At the moment, we are still only able to welcome people with pre-booked tickets as we um, continue to do our best, but in the hope that the weather is going to turn and give us a, a window when we can dry up. Well, the ITV Evening News continues with the national and international news at 6.30. Here's Mark Austin. The government is to hold a crisis meeting on the future of 15,000 steel jobs in the UK. As Tata Steel says it will sell its British plants, ministers say all options are open. Labour claims the government is in disarray. Teachers for toddlers before they go to school, scientists say it could improve their life chances. And the postmaster who went on a 600 mile round trip to deliver a letter he'd forgotten to send. Join Mary Nightingale and me at 6.30. We will, thank you. Now, his story attracted worldwide attention, and today, Chunky the dog and his owners and supporters helped hand in a 500,000 signature petition calling for tougher animal protection laws. Yes, Chunky the Chihuahua Cross was beaten, set alight and fed drugs during an ordeal described by the RSPCA as the worst they had ever seen. But you will be delighted to know Chunky is well and has made a remarkable recovery since being found in a rubbish tip here on the south coast. Well, our political correspondent Phil Hornby caught up with him and his supporters with their petition in Westminster earlier today. A familiar face in the crowd. This was his big day. The day Chunky the Survivor 
became Chunky the campaigner and he took coming to Parliament totally in his stride. Uh, he's doing much better than what he, than what he uh, when it first happened. He's got a lot better, he's got a lot more energy now, he's more friendly with everyone. Yeah, he's been a lot better, yeah. And what do you think about coming to London, do you think? He's enjoying himself, he's walking around like he owns the place. <laughs> When he was attacked, tortured, set on fire and left for dead, his plight touched people across the country and across the world. Four teenagers, aged 15 and 16, pleaded guilty to animal cruelty and were disqualified from keeping animals for five years. But campaigners say that's not justice for Chunky. They've organised a petition with nearly half a million signatures calling for an animal cruelty register. It's a petition to create a database for animal abusers um, so that um, if you were buying another dog in the future, the, the person who was selling it to you would have knowledge that you'd abused an animal. Could it really work? I think it could because there's other states, like in the United States, have, that have actually introduced an animal data, abuse database. What do you think about the response that there's been to Chunky's story and to uh, the petition? Completely overwhelming. It's just it's so overwhelming. I just can't describe it. They were emotional but determined as they handed their petition in to the government, determined that some good should come out of Chunky's terrible ordeal. How well has he recovered? Because at the time you must have wondered whether he was actually going to survive. Yeah, no, it was a hard time, but um, he's pulled through. He's a lot better. He's a little bit flinchy towards some people, but considering what he's been through, he's so much better. It's great, yeah. yeah. And what do you think of the response you had from people? We can't thank like, the people enough for the support that they've like given us. Yeah, without them, we wouldn't, it wouldn't have got this big. It's basically them that's brought everything to light and showed his story, basically. They're hoping his story will stop dreadful cruelty in the future. Phil Holmby there, and Phil's at Westminster for us now. Phil, great to see Chunky looking so well, but nonetheless, this was an appalling case of cruelty. So what are the chances of tougher penalties introduced by law? Well, the government say they take this uh, very seriously. Uh, lifetime bans are available. Some people do get lifetime bans, although not in this instance. The point of the petition today, I think, is to give people information. If somebody comes along to buy a dog from you, how do you know whether they're banned from keeping animals or not? And they think this national database uh, would help with that and would stop people who have been guilty of cruelty from, uh, from getting animals again. As she said, in this case, the teenagers were banned from keeping animals for five years and were told to pay costs in total of a few thousand pounds, probably paid by a rich uh, dad. That's the point, isn't it? Many say it's just not enough. That's right. They, uh, the campaigners say there should be massive fines, possible jail sentences too, in extreme, in extreme cases. Uh, their basic message is uh, we've got to take animal cruelty more seriously in this country. Certainly have felt for now. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's a big year for the England football team with this summer's European Championships in France. And England continued preparations last night with their 2-1 defeat to the Netherlands at Wembley. It's also a big year, of course, for England's most successful team. As we remember the summer when football really did come home. In 1966, England won the World Cup for the first and only time and you missed it. I did miss it, but this year <laughs> it's the 50th anniversary of that special occasion. And throughout the year, members of that legendary squad will be touring the country to relive the victory with more Chris Dawkes. ITV Meridian Sport Report, sponsored by WeWantAnyCar.com, the Cash for Cars website. It's widely regarded as the greatest achievement in English sporting history. A feat never achieved before or since. Bobby Moore led England up to the Royal Box to receive the Jules Rimet Cup and the winner's medals. 50 years on, five of England's World Cup winning squad are touring the country to regale fans with stories from the time. Amongst them, goalkeeper Gordon Banks, defender Jack Charlton and hat-trick hero Sir Geoff Hurst. Racing to beat the whistle, Jeff Hurst saw an opening in the defence and achieved the hat-trick. The important thing in the, in the team, and I mentioned the team, is that you win the game. Uh, as, we've, as time's gone on, of course, the hat-trick becomes a little more relevant, a little more significant, because we had, nobody's achieved it since. I think Zidane got a couple when France won it in 98. 
and he only got two and within seconds my grandson texted me and said, Grandpa, you've still got the record. Ah, memories, his goal, everybody remembers his goal. His couple of saves that he made. One was, one was a back pass by me which caused him a bit of a problem. <laughs> the memories of, 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 of walking down that tunnel, you know, uh, the roar of the crowd. Well, first of all, <laughs> the shaking in the tunnel. <laughs> And then the national anthem, you know, so proud to, to, to wear the shirt. Uh, and then the Queen coming down and, and, and uh, shaking our hands and wishing us all the best. John, we got it. Something that I just never, ever dreamt about, you know, all my career, you know. But it, but it happened and it was, it was fantastic. Uh, Three years ago, Alf Ramsey set out on the hard road that led to the World Cup. Only the optimists thought he could possibly succeed. But it was England that the whole world of sport was now cheering. What strikes you about tonight are the range of ages in the room, from those who remember the 1966 World Cup to others like myself who weren't even born then but can still reel off the names. Banks, Cohen, Ball, the Charlton brothers, Peters, Hurst, names that have been passed down through the generations. The boys of 66, synonymous with success. Chris Dawkes, ITV News. Special day, and it's an extra special day today for a set of quads from Berkshire who are celebrating their third birthday. Yes, Joshua, James, Lauren, and Emily Turner were born at the Royal Berkshire Hospital back in 2013 after their parents spent years trying to conceive. The odds of having them were 70 million to one as their two sets of identical twins. Kate Bunkle went along to wish them a happy birthday. Oh, oh no, James is in the water too. <laughs> The Turner Quads celebrate turning three. Oh no! You're all in the water! It's a milestone for their mum Sharon, who gave up her job to care for the children full time. I think it's actually getting harder in some respects because they want to do everything themselves. So everything takes twice as long. Right, Lauren insists on putting her shoes on, which is good, but then she'll put them on the wrong feet. I'm like, there's the wrong feet. And start again. And then you want to put your own tights on and your own socks on and your own vest. And it, it's just things like that that just, it's good, but it just takes, everything takes so long. We followed the quad's progress since they were born in 2013, 11 weeks early and weighing just two pounds each. The chances of conceiving two sets of identical twins is 70 million to one. They're one of only four sets of double boy-girl twins in the world. To the Turners, they're especially precious after years and thousands of pounds spent trying to conceive. Caring for them, though, has been exhausting and would have been impossible without Sharon's parents who moved in to help. At each stage, I think it can't get any harder and then it does. And it just keeps getting harder and harder. I mean, obviously, the night time is a lot easier now because generally, I mean, we do have a few problems with the boys sleeping, but they are quite good um, compared to when they were tiny babies and I was only getting an hour's sleep. But... I'm hoping that once, because after Easter they get their um, three year funding, so they're going to be at nursery a little bit more. So I'm hoping that it's going to be a bit easier. Me and mum can just have a bit of time to do the housework and <laughs> just catch up on things that we don't get time to catch up on. Things should get much easier next year when the four will start at school. Kate Bunkle, ITV News, Lambourne. A wonderful wow. family, and I bet the Turners could do with a trip to the Maldives. You're right, and in fact, the Maldives <laughs> could be nearer than they think. In fact, a new exhibition's open to show Brighton Sea Life Centre's conservation work on the Indian Ocean Isle. A change in global temperatures means huge swathes of coral was lost there. The display also features a new seahorse breeding programme, as Charlotte Wilkins will now tell us. This is what the coral reef in the Maldives should look like, but in 1998, 90% of coral there was lost due to global warming. 
Sea Life has since been helping local people to build frames to help the fragile coral to regrow and replenish. It's all part of a coral conservation project which is highlighted as part of a new attraction at the Sea Life Centre in Brighton. All corals, you can legitimately say, are under threat currently. They're so delicate that anything just throws it completely out of balance and that can be global warming through temperature change in our seas, pollution and we can end up wiping out entire coral reefs because of that. The display also includes a seahorse nursery where the sea creatures are bred and then safely reared before being sent to other sea life centres across the world. This species of seahorse is actually an Australian species. It's the biggest species of seahorse in the world and it's one of our most successful breeding programmes. Some people might know it's the male who becomes pregnant. They have a couple of days of a very romantic courtship and then they dance and the female will lay her eggs inside the male's pouch and that's where he fertilises them and he'll be pregnant for up to four weeks and then he'll have actual contractions and give birth to tiny, tiny, perfectly formed little seahorses. In this tank you get a chance to see some of the babies which have already been born. The larger one there, just behind the plant, is about five months old. The smaller one, resting on the rock at the bottom there, is about 15 weeks old. And the teeny tiny one there, over this side, you can just about see, it's just five weeks old. Sea Life Brighton may be the oldest aquarium in the country, but they hope their projects will help to protect our precious marine life for future generations. Charlotte Wilkins, ITV News, Brighton. Helen Plint is with us now. Helen, the weather's been weird today. Has it's not quite been the Maldives-esque, mm. has it? No, <laughs> what, what do you think the weather was like today? It was raining one minute. Sunny the next. Sunshine the next. Absolutely. I've asked 10, you're just part of my straw poll. I've asked 10 people today and got 10 different answers. So it's not a trick question. The weather is all over the place at the moment. So if you've caught a shower, it's been pretty chilly as well. So around eight degrees or thereabouts. If you're in the sunshine, around 12 degrees. That was actually as it was in Brighton around three o'clock this afternoon. So to sum this up, of course, all of the pictures come flooding into our inbox. So I've got a few to show you, which yeah. just shows how different it's been. So this was Ilford today. Clinton Whale took this for us and it shows, you know, the river almost bursting its banks. A minute later, we've got the hail. This yeah. is from Greg Wood in Southampton. And look, it's quite lucky hail for him as well. <laughs> <laughs> so he wins out. And last but not least, this is from Chris Brown in Benbridge on the Isle of Wight. Of course, not quite ending in gold, but not far away. Great That's picture. It's going to be a golden ending for us all. Here she is with your forecast, Helen Plint. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe, Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. So you get the idea by now. It's a pretty typical sunshine and showers set up over the next 24 hours. Between now and then overnight, it will be fairly chilly for some, but then a ridge of high pressure nudges its way into gear for tomorrow. So this does mean everything should stay largely dry and fine through the day. This ominous band of wet weather in sinking down from the northwest shouldn't affect us too much it stalls directly north of us really and this does mean that we herald more warm weather from the continent over the weekend so temperatures topping off at around 14 or 15 degrees come saturday and sunday a far cry from that overnight tonight though for those furthest west under the clear skies temperatures tumbling away sub-zero for many and a good chance a bit of frost around first thing tomorrow morning mist and fog also a possibility but as you can see beautiful sunshine for many as well a little bit more in the way of cloud along the coast and into the afternoon the outside chance of a couple of showers but certainly the exception rather than the rule and with highs of 12 degrees pretty pleasant so a quick look at the high tide times now and in Bournemouth just after midnight and again at half past 12 in the afternoon Euro Tunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Well, in just a moment this Wednesday evening, we have the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale. Rachel Hepworth has got our late news. Do join her if you can. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you very much for watching. See you again, same time, same place tomorrow from us all. Take See care. Bye-bye.